Dear Heavenly Father, gracious God, uh, again, thank you that we are here and freely able to worship you. Father, today as I uh, give the message, I ask that you just lead my words. You speak through me. If my own words try to get in the way, Father, I ask that they fall on deaf ears. You're such a wonderful, gracious God, and I know that you've got a message out there for all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning again. I think you guys are probably getting sick of seeing me today, but but uh, you know what? I'm not going to pick on Pastor Mike this morning. He's not here to defend himself, so we'll just we'll skip that part of the sermon. I'm going to move this real quick, too. All right. How many of you Christians in here believe the Bible to be the inerrant word of God, the infallible word? Good. How many of you believe that reading and studying, having knowledge of Scripture, is important for your Christian walk? Good. Okay. How many of you then read at least a chapter of your Bible every day this week? Five days? You guys? Three? One? Okay. Okay. There's a lot of Christians who do not, even though it's important to them for their Christian walk, they do not read Scripture every day. Um, Some of them don't read it at all during the week. There's lots of reasons why. When I was studying to give this message, I came across this little story that I thought really applied. And let me read this to you. A school teacher lost her life savings in a business scheme that had been elaborately explained to her by a swindler. <clears throat> when her investment disappeared and her dreams were shattered, she went to the Better Business Bureau. Why on earth didn't you come to us before you did this, the official asked. Didn't you know about the Better Business Bureau? Oh, yes, said the teacher, sadly. I've always known about you, but I didn't come because I was afraid you'd tell me not to do it. And you guys see where I'm going with this story. Isn't that the folly of our human nature? Even though we know where all the answers lie in God's Word, we don't turn there for fear of what it might say to us. And a sermon I heard, not here, not here, it wasn't this church, it was a different church, a very large church, I heard. The pastor came up there and he spoke and he was speaking a sermon about the Bible. And he stated in his sermon that the Bible covered the big picture, but it really didn't apply to the little everyday aspects of our lives, is what he stated. Well, my opinion of that is the guy didn't know what he was talking about. Okay, that's my opinion. It's a very large church. They have over 2,000 members, so I didn't really get FaceTime to talk to this pastor afterwards. Um, he didn't know me from Adam, so he was busy talking to other people. I, I couldn't even have found him in this church. It was so big. Now, if I had to venture a guess, though, and like I said, I'm guessing. I don't want to put words. I would guess that that pastor did not have a clear understanding of Scripture, and that's why he would say that, that it does not cover little aspects of our lives that it only covers the big picture. And I think that is the big elephant in the room with Christians today, is we don't have a clear enough understanding of God's Word because we, as a whole group, are not reading God's Word and studying God's Word nearly enough. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure if we can. We should constantly be in prayer and reading Scripture as often as possible. 
I do know this, though. I do know that Scripture does have all the answers, even for those little aspects and those little areas of your life, or the areas you consider little. I know it because Scripture tells me that it has those answers. Actually, a good place to find things out about Scripture, the Scripture, God's Word itself, is in God's Word. He talks about it in quite a few different places within the Bible. Um, we know that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, it's useful for rebuking, it's useful for correcting, and training in righteousness. We know from Scripture that Scripture is, we know that God's Word is a lamp for our feet, a light unto our path. It shows us which way to go. Now, like I said, Christians in America, we take this for granted. I don't know how many of you were here when uh, the gentleman from the Voice of the Martyrs was here, but he showed a video, and I tried to find the video, and I couldn't. I would have showed it to you today. But he showed this video of some people in another country where the Bible's illegal, and they're not allowed to read it. And they got their first, there was about 50 of them standing there, and they got their first Bibles ever. And these people were crying and jumping for joy and doing something that we take for granted. I've got like 12 Bibles in my house, one in almost every room just laying around. And, I, and sometimes I don't even pick them up. I grab my phone instead and look Scripture up on it because I take it for granted what these people are dying for in other countries. We, as Christians, need to read, study, and learn our Scripture more. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we need to memorize the whole book. But we do need to read and understand it. Memorization is not a bad thing either, but I just want to make sure to tell you that memorization is not a good thing if we don't understand what we're memorizing. You know, for example, there's a lot of atheists out there that have memorized a lot of the Bible, but they have no clear meaning of what the Scripture says. <clears throat> there's some other Christian um, denominations, I guess we'll call them, that memorize Scripture, that have no clear, they don't understand the meaning of what they've memorized. So we need to study it and learn it. There's a lot of problems in the United States today. Would you guys agree? We've got financial problems. We've got housing problems. We've got marriage problems. We've got problems in school. All these problems are just little legs off the main problem. And the main problem in America is that we have a spiritual problem. And a big part of that spiritual problem is that we do not know and we do not understand God's word as Christians as a whole. It's an art that's getting lost in this country. And we need to fight that. One of the largest, a pastor of one of the largest churches in the United States, a big, huge, popular church, came out within the last year. This church has 8,000 members, and this is what he's teaching them, is that... No matter what, it doesn't matter who you are or what you believe, you're going to heaven. He even wrote a book about it. The book's called Love Wins. I recommend that you don't read it. Because um, we know it's clearly stated in Scripture that that is incorrect. But he's got a church of 8,000 members that he's teaching this to. We've lost our understanding of God's Word. We get so upset when we see other, especially when we see non-believers attack the Bible. That's my question to us as Christians. How can we expect the world to respect a book that we so easily neglect? I was curious when I was studying for this um, just to see what some of the reasons were that we're not reading our scriptures. 
And as I was going through, I found on the internet, I found a, a place called the Center for Bible Engagement. They interviewed or pulled, I'm sorry, pulled 11,025 Christians and asked them, why aren't you reading the scripture? Why aren't you reading your Bible every day? There was 21 different excuses given out of those 11,000 plus people. Some of them were redundant excuses. They were the same excuse and just had a different name or a different word for it. So I combined some of them. <clears throat> and I would like to talk to you about a few of these reasons. There's one reason, the number one reason, it stood out way above the rest. Um, over 51% of the people that they pulled gave this as a reason for not reading scripture. Does anybody want to take a guess at what it is? Don't have time. Exactly. They don't have time to read their scripture. And when I saw that, 51%, that was a lot more than I thought was going to be. I knew that reason was going to be on there, but I didn't know it was going to be that high. I mean, it's the next, the next reason was called unique reasons, which is unique to each individual, and that came in at like 20%. So not having enough time by far and away was way out in the lead. Um, and that reminds me of a sermon I heard a couple of years ago. I'm going to share, I shared it once before a little bit. Some of you may have not been here. I'm going to share a little bit of it again. What we tend to do as Christians is we take and make a checklist for our lives. Sunday morning gets here, so we write, okay, Jesus right there at the top, number one on the list. And then we write family below it, and then maybe work, and then maybe some me time goes next on the list. So then what we do, okay, I went to church. Okay, Jesus, check, you're off the list. Now I can do what I want with the rest of my list. So then what happens, we go on, it's not Sunday anymore, it gets to be about Tuesday, and we find out, okay, the kid's got, one kid's got a basketball game, one kid's got a volleyball game, and I got to cover for somebody else's shift at work today, so I'm going to have to work three or four extra hours. Okay, sorry Jesus, but I got to put work up top today, and then I got to put uh, family next. Okay, so Jesus, you can come in third on my list today. And then by the end of the week, Jesus may be down to ninth on that list because we've prioritized through our own understanding, through our own rule. What we need to do is we need to take Jesus off the list, period, and we need to put Jesus right in the center of our lives. Not at the top, not in the, not in the middle of the list, and not at the bottom. In the center of our lives and take that list and let it, instead of a list going up and down, a list that's circular that revolves around him. <clears throat> I think when we do that as Christians, then we see that checklist that we make for ourselves, the priorities on that really change drastically, don't they? When we've got Jesus at the center. Things like praying and going to church and reading scripture come usually before everything else when Jesus is at the center. Missions work, you know, whatever. We really see our priorities change when we take Jesus off the top of a list and put him at the center of our lives. When it comes to scripture, when it comes to reading it, we need to be like the Bereans. You guys know who the Bereans were? John, John, he knows who they were. The Bereans were these guys that studied scripture. They studied it every day. They studied it so they could make sure that when Paul was there on a mission, that he was telling the truth and not talking smack to him. That's what they did. They studied Scripture every day. And they were, because of studying Scripture, they were called and considered noble. We've got to make Christ the center of our lives so that we can have the correct priorities on our list. Now, I would probably argue that some of our excuses for being too busy 
And believe me, I understand this excuse. I've got three kids, a wife. I'm always running around doing something. I understand how we can fall into that trap. But I would argue that some of our excuses for being too busy actually put us into another group of excuses that was on the list of reasons people don't read their Bible. And I was actually a little shocked. This one really jumped off the page at me because uh, I was just surprised that the people said this. 334 of the Christians that they interviewed admitted that they were too lazy to read their Bible. Now, I've got to commend them for telling the truth, because I probably wouldn't say, I'm too lazy, I'm not reading it tonight. Um, I think some of the things we do, though, some of the lazy things, we say we're too busy. Some of us, maybe we can read Scripture tonight because our favorite television show was on, and we needed to watch that. I would contend that is too lazy, not too busy. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, you need to do it all. That's everything for the glory of God. And sitting around being lazy brings no glory to God whatsoever. You guys can rationalize it however you want. Um, Ladies, if you're sitting around watching Grey's Anatomy, you're not bringing glory to God. Or the men, if you're watching a show like Pawn Stars or Swamp People, you're not bringing glory to God. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't, I'm not saying that at some point during your day, you shouldn't maybe sit on the couch and turn on a TV and just recharge your batteries a little bit. I'm just saying that you need to put Christ at the center of your life so when you do sit down to watch the tube that it's got its proper place on your list. It's properly prioritized. Okay, so we've talked about, you know, we've talked about the time management issues that were on the list. We've got too busy and we've got too lazy. Those are easily overcome. We just need to do everything for God's glory. We need to put the Christ at the center of our lives and prioritize all the other little lists and let them revolve around Christ. Okay, now the next group of excuses or reasons on this list, um, I'm not going to bust anybody's chops over this one because this is one I really struggled with when I came back to Christ. Um, And I think it's, you know, a lot of people struggle with this. Um, It actually led to one of the most embarrassing moments in my life. To me, anyway, it was one of my, you know, the very first Sunday school class I came to here at FBC. I did not understand the scripture that they were talking about in class. I did not know where any of the scriptures were at because I hadn't, I hadn't read the Bible in 10 years. And I felt at the Sunday school class like I was being talked at and talked over my head, and I hated it, and I was embarrassed. All because I had not been reading scripture. Um, and one of the big reasons I was not reading scripture is because I didn't understand what I was reading. A lot of that had to do with because I wasn't coming to church and getting discipled also is why I didn't understand it. But I want to offer to those people that struggle understanding what they're reading. And like this was one of the other big excuses, big reasons why people don't read the Bible. I want to offer some help, some encouragement to you guys. You know, after that Sunday school class and over the course of the last several years that I've been here, I've had to learn to not lean on my own understanding. That's one of the main reasons that I don't understand because I put it, I'm so prideful that I try to do it all on my own. Let me read a passage for you guys. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 16, if anybody wants to follow along. I'll give you a second to flip your Bibles. Once again, that was 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 16.
The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may freely understand what God has given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? That scripture tells me in a very clear fashion. Do not lean on my own understanding. Seek help. Seek guidance from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helped write the Bible. He can give you a clear understanding of its meaning. Seek Him out. Seek out the Holy Spirit. And don't lean on your own understanding. Any time that you go to start studying or reading Scripture, pray first, pray during, and pray after you're done. When you've got a Christian who is in constant prayer and they've got an old raggedy, worn-out Bible because they're in it all the time, you take those two things. I can't think of a more awesome, powerful combination that we as Christians can do in our Scripture and praying all the time. Very powerful. I love to see that in people. It's very awe-inspiring. You can also seek help from other Christians. Um, a person that taught me a lot about reading the Bible um, is sitting right here in the back at the computer, and that's Randy, our deacon. I, I don't mind throwing him, throwing his name out there and throwing him under the bus. I'm sure if you're having trouble understanding Scripture that he probably would not mind taking some of his time and teaching you some of the things that he taught me about Scripture and about reading it. He's actually put on a couple of classes here. He doesn't mind a bit, I don't think. I don't want to speak too freely for him, though. So, But that leads me to another reason, though, when I say seek out other people. We need to be careful, and we need to discern what other people that we're speaking to. We need to make sure that we're speaking to mature Christians. Another huge reason on the list of excuses that people aren't reading the Bible is because they're reading other spiritual books. Now, I'm giving these Christians the benefit of the doubt. When they say other spiritual books, I could not find out if that meant they were reading, say, the Koran, or if they're reading you know, books that, from family Christian stores that are by Christian authors. So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to talk about books that are wrote by other Christian authors. Um, there's some great books out there. I love to read, and, I, and these other books are great if you're reading them side by side with the Bible. If you're not in Scripture when you're reading these other books, these other books can be dangerous because <clears throat> you don't know what's in them. Those little devotionals, has is, is anybody here read one of them little daily 365-day devotionals? They're nice little books as long as you're in God's Word. If you're reading, most of, the, most of those little devotionals I've seen, they've got maybe two paragraphs from the author, and then at the bottom they've got one verse on the bottom. And to me, that is a big do not do when you're trying to understand Scripture. Never, ever, ever, and this is important, never, ever, ever read just a verse of the Bible. That is dangerous. You know, if, 
if the Holy Spirit is in command when you're reading Scripture, then the next important thing is context. And you cannot get that from one verse. You need to read at least a paragraph, if not more, the whole chapter. Force yourself to make the time to read the whole book, if, you know, if you can. Because context is so important when we're talking about Scripture. That's why those little devotionals, I think, even though they're nice if you're reading the Word, if you're not, I think they're dangerous. Because what you get is the author's meaning instead of getting God's meaning. And you may not know what that author is speaking about. There's some very famous people out there that, are cons- that call themselves Christians that take little bits of Scripture so small and they warp it so badly but we don't notice it because we're not checking them against Scripture like the Breens did with Paul. <clears throat> now, the last group of excuses I want to talk about fall into an entirely different category. I don't want to say it's my favorite would definitely be the wrong, wrong word, but it's the one that definitely gets me the most riled up, the most passionate. You could say angry even. Not, not that I ever get angry very often. 2 Timothy 4. I was reading this in there. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in the view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And that's the last group of excuses. There's a, got to be a large group of Christians out there that do not believe the very first question that I asked you, that the, that the Bible is the infallible Word of God, the inerrant Word of God. They believe that you can only take little bits and pieces of it, and the rest of it's not really true or applicable to our lives today. They say, uh, what's the word? And antiquity. Antiquated. Is that the right word, John? Thank you. This group takes little pieces of the Bible, little verses, because that's all they read. They read just one verse. They don't put it in a context. And then they take it and they use it to justify bad behavior and to justify sin. We've got a lot of problem with that. All you guys got to do is turn on the 6 o'clock news at night, and you can see that. These are the ones we need to have our swords out and our swords sharp and ready. And you guys know what I mean by swords, right? Scripture. The Word of God is our sword. Remember, though, warning, that sword is double-edged. It cuts both ways. That's why we need to have it sharp and ready to go, studying it. You know, because what happens when we run across these false teachers? A big thing in the world today now, you see it, WCIA, I get on uh, their Facebook page a lot and get into arguments quite a bit with people that are on there. Sometimes other Christians that are out there teaching a false message. Like I said, this is the one that really, it, it really does, it gets me angry. And I had to practice talking this a lot last night so I wasn't screaming at you when I was saying it today. But they're going out there and they're memorizing five or six verses only out of the Bible. They have no idea of the context of those verses. They read the part they wanted to read and they stopped reading it. They have no idea of the meaning of those verses. And you guys know what I'm talking about. We see, as Christians, we see a behavior that is bad. 
And then we say this behavior is bad. Such as, you know, I talked a lot about this with the fishers of men. This is the second time I got to preach this week. This is great, by the way. I got to preach to the fishers of men Friday night. And one of the major topics we talked about was abortion Friday night. I know it sounds crazy. I had a whole group of 30 or 40 men out here, and we talked about abortion. But we say, as Christians, abortion is murder. And so then we get a false teacher out there. Because, first of all, we're not even allowed to call it abortion anymore. It's reproductive freedom now. We had to make it sound less harsh than what it is. We get these false teachers out there that say, Jesus said, you love everybody and you don't judge anybody. And that's what they say. And they say, because you just did that, you are hateful, you are ignorant, you are intolerant, and you're racist, and you're a bigot. You guys have heard this, right? This is their, that's their main argument. These false teachers is calling us names. And you know why it's their main argument? Because it's very simple and very effective. Because what happens a lot is we're not in Scripture enough, and we get called these names, and we're afraid they might be true. So we shut our mouths, and we let the bad behavior go on and on and on. That's what we've done with abortion. I talked about this Friday night. Abortion came about in the 70s, got legal, you know, from the court through Roe versus Wade, and it is developing into something that now they're going to, there's a movement out there that wants to have something called full birth abortions. I know Randy's heard of this. I don't know if the rest of you, I know whoever was here Friday night, I told you what it was. You guys, I will explain to you what you don't, if you don't know what a full birth abortion is. Okay, you have your baby. You go your nine months while you're pregnant. You have your baby. From the day that baby is born until it's around six months old, if you decide you don't like that baby or it's too hard for you or whatever, you can have an abortion. That's what this movement's pushing for. Now, does that sound like reproductive freedom to you guys? That sounds like flat-out murder to me. And you know why I know that? Because it says in here that it is. And that's why we need to read this. So when we've got people out there saying that something like full abortion is a good thing, we can take it and we can smack them down because that's what they need. They need a good swift kick in the pants. <clears throat> As Pastor Mike would say, with love. You know, we, I'm going to get close here to closing in a minute and then Brother Randy's going to come up and do an invitation. God created us to worship him. And one of the ways we worship him is by following his commands. One of those commands was to spread the gospel of Jesus and to go out and make disciples of all nations. Now, if we are Christians that aren't reading our Bibles, how do we even know what the gospel is to share it? We will not have the words to share the gospel if we don't read them. How can you make a disciple if you don't know what a disciple is because you haven't read it? And for one reason or another, you may not be in God's word. You have to be to follow God's commands. You don't even know what God's commands are if you're not reading his word. We as Christians need to go to our Bible regularly We need to open it prayerfully. We need to read it expectantly and live it joyfully. Now, hopefully, none of you prayerfully, none of you fall into the groups of excuses or reasons I was talking about on a regular basis. We all fall short of the glory of God. And we're all going to make, make mistakes. But hopefully nobody is falling into these reasons on a regular basis. If you are, some of you may feel I stepped on your toes today. 
And I'm going to tell you guys the same things I told the fish or the men Friday night. If I stepped on your toes, I am not in the least bit sorry. Because if you are a Christian and you are not reading your scripture regularly, you need to have your toes stepped on. And if anybody were ever to come up here and preach different than that to you, then they need worse than their toes stepped on. And you need to know Scripture so you can tell them that. Bow with me, guys. Dear Heavenly Father, gracious God, you have given us the wonderful gift of your Word so that we can be guided and directed in everything in our lives, Father. I ask that you, uh, you teach us how to put you at the center and make time in our lives. Whatever is hindering us, holding us back from knowing your word, Father, take it and remove it from our lives. We need your word to survive, Father, to know what's going on, to battle in this world against bad ideas. And I just ask that you keep giving us your word. You preserved it for thousands of years for us so we would have it now, Father. And you, I just ask that you give us the strength to do our part and read it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.